Something a little different today. This past week, I was interviewed by Justin Poley, who runs a podcast, Young and Sanctified. This was a real privilege for me. First off, Justin took the parables class from me a while back, and I don't often get the chance to follow up a conversation with students, especially after the class is over or they've moved on. So I really enjoyed the privilege to talk to him and catch up and see what he's been doing. Second, for the past three years, I've been experimenting with YouTube, seeing how I can take the material that I've been teaching in seminary and bring it to anybody anywhere on YouTube for free. Justin's been doing the same thing. He's been using our podcast to interview professors and bring the riches of seminary to people who are not in school. This is so important. To be able to minister in the 21st century, you need to know the skills of using the internet, mediums, and platforms like YouTube and podcasts. So I really applaud his efforts and I really hope his podcast takes off. Do give him a listen and also subscribe to his podcast. That will really help Justin out a great deal. I'm going to have the link up here depending on the browser that you're using to watch YouTube on, but it will definitely be in the show more section underneath this video. Justin has been interviewing a number of different professors specifically on issues relating to Christology or the study of who Jesus is. So make sure to give his podcast a listen. I've been editing a few of the highlights from our interview and I really hope this little video of mine whets your appetite to go over and listen to his podcast. So over to the interview. All right, Dr. Paris, thank you so much for joining Young and Sanctified. You know, I had you in a class, and I think it was a general consensus that everybody loved uh, your teaching method and your content. So I really appreciate you joining today. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. So before we get into the good stuff of talking about a parable, can you let's get into the good stuff of, of hearing about you first. And can you just share a little bit about you and how you got into uh, studying the um, parables? I got into the parables through a rather long route. It started when I did my seminary degree back in the 80s. And back then you had to write a thesis. And I did it on the history of how the Great Commission, Matthew 28, the very end mm -hmm. there, has been interpreted. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations of the world. I uh, went to Fuller Seminary, did a THM and then went on from there to the University of Nottingham and did a degree in philosophical hermeneutics, which is the philosophy of how you interpret, understand, or explain anything. And my supervisor there suggested that one of the passages I should look at as a test case is a parable because they're really little kind of word pictures. They open up a lot of room for how the play for how we interpret them. And that is how I first got into parables, is his saying, you will study this <laughs> type thing. And I fell in love with the parables as I started interpreting. I just realized that these are such small, little, simple stories, but they contain such powerful insights. They challenge us and they provoke our thought that I thought, I just need to do more work on this. So after I finished my PhD, I did more work in, in that area. I've been working on the parables now for the past 25 to 30 years. Hmm. Wow, wow. I didn't, I didn't know you had a, a THM too. For, you said from Fuller? That is definitely a, something on my mind as, you know, what's next for me after my, my master's. Um, so before we started recording, you also mentioned that you've been working in cognitive linguistics for, you know, the past 15 years or so. So how does this inform one's study of the, or affect one's study of the parables? Um, well, cognitive linguistics is a field of study that really started in the late 80s. Cognitive linguistics really works on the basis that the way you understand anything and the way you express yourself linguistically and understand linguistically is the same as any other function within our brain. So when we, when we pick up a co coffee cup and we say, ah, the cup is in my hand, it's all based on how we understand how our body works. We pick it up, it's in our hand, we can move it, we can uh, do all sorts of experiments with it. And this then helps us un to understand phrases like in, the, in John where it says, you are in my hand and I am in God's hand. It's not some 
figurative little fancy embellishment of language, but it's something that's very, very basic to us. We understand what it means to be in somebody's hand, and we know what it's like to somebody else to be. When you're in someone's hand, you can pick them up, you can control them, you can protect them, you can use them. And this all helps us to understand what that little figure of speech that Jesus uses is talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I remember having to read just the first chapter of uh, Mark, Turn Mark Turner, right? Yes, I mean, yeah, the literary mind. Mark Turner, the literary mind, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, so like so far in seminary, right now it's only been like biblical theology, systematic theology, and practical theology. So introducing cognitive linguistics was like a completely different paradigm that my brain was not used to. So this is exciting stuff. And it, I can see, I mean, it made so much sense though, you know, reading it and hearing you uh, teach about it. It makes a lot of sense. Can you share a little bit about like, what are the purpose, what's the purpose of a parable? Because I, I think most people, I remember, I think in Sunday school, it's a earth, like a earthly story with a heavenly meaning or something like that. Yeah, I would say the primary purpose of a parable is that they are de designed to make us think. When Jesus tells a parable, like, let's take the parable of the treasure hidden in the field. The kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field that a man finds, buries, goes and sells all they has so that he might own that field. And you go, okay, you got four verbs there. Finds, covers, sells, and then buys. But you've got this incredible story that's embodied within that whole thing. What does it mean then for us to find something that we don't expect? How do we react to it? How does that change our life where we sell everything that we have so that we can now possess this thing? And then finally, our commitment. We go and we buy that field. It forces us to think through, how does that relate to my life? Did I go and sell everything that I have? Have I bought that field? Um, am I totally committed to it? I think the other thing that a parable does is that if we go back to the original situation of Jesus out there on the countryside, parables are a very safe but yet dangerous way for him to teach. They're safe because he's entering into conflict with the religious leaders of his day, and, and for good reasons. I mean, they want to make sure that everything that's being taught is orthodox and we don't have fake teachers running around the countryside. And you can imagine some Pharisee or a rabbi going out and hearing that, listening to Jesus teach on the countryside that day. And then he comes back and he, that I'm not sure about this guy. I, I, he's kind of orthodox, but he's teaching some very questionable things. And then three months later, he thinks back about that little story, and all of a sudden he gets it. And it's like he's been carrying around a hand grenade, this little parable, all this time. And then all of a sudden, when, when you get it, boom, it goes off. And now he finds himself covered with theological shrapnel. And he has to figure out, what do I do now? How do I put all this back together? What, how do I think of Yahweh and the law and the Torah and the synagogues and maintaining ritual purity within Israel and my relationship to all these things? And how come I never saw this treasure before? So they're safe in that he gets to teach and no one can say, you're a heretic. But by the same token, they're very dangerous because then they go out and when people begin to realize the implications of the parables within their lives, it really causes or it really challenges them as to what they're going to do about it. Yeah, well, I, of course. You know, I, like I said in the beginning, your class was really formative. And, and just how I think about the scripture in general, but specifically the, the parables. So, no, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm really grateful. Um, so can we move into talking about a specific parable for a little bit? So... I'm assuming most people listening or viewing this would know the parable of the prodigal son. But but just in case they don't, can you like share, you know, like a executive summary of this parable? Because I know it's one of the longer ones. In order to understand the parable of the prodigal son, you really have to start at the very start of Luke chapter 15. And right at the very beginning there, it says, now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming to hear him, Jesus. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law were complaining. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. 
And so as a result, then Jesus tells you three parables. The first one with the parable of the shepherd who loses his sheep. It's interesting in Luke's account that he tells us that, you know, which one of you, if he has a hundred sheep and loses one of them, would not leave the 99 in the open pasture and go back and look for the one that he had lost. Luke specifically tells you that the shepherd lost the sheep. The sheep didn't wander away. The shepherd lost the sheep. So who's, who's the person with the problem here? It's the shepherd. So he lost one in a hundred. Then you have the woman who had 10 small silver coins. She's lost one-tenth of all of her wealth. But once again, she's the person who lost the coin. And then finally, we come to the parable of the father who loses his son. You've got, you've got this progression of intensity from one out of 100 to one out of 10 to now one out of two. How did God lose anything? I mean, especially if you're a good Calvinist. God can't lose anything. Um, but you go back to Genesis 2, 3, and 4 when God lost Adam and Eve. And then uh, the story of Noah and the story of the fall of Israel and rebellious kings all the way down to the time of Christ. You really get this fit, picture that from the Old Testament that God has lost something. And ever since then, he has been in an active search to get that back. And when we come back to him, these, this is a picture of what it's like. It's a metaphorical image of what it's like when we return to God. And interesting, interesting. Because that's something, you know, in this journey of Christology that it's very interesting to see the little, the little like nuggets where Jesus alludes that he is the God of Yah uh, Yahweh of Israel. Very fascinating. I once heard a pastor say that, I'm going to paraphrase the the scripture, it says when he comes, he came to his senses, that, that Greek word there, and I didn't prep you for this, so we can cut this out too, but that Greek word there um, means to like a, take a good hard look at himself. Is that true? It gives you a picture. It's actually a very interesting, um, in the Greek it would be, and coming to himself. There's no, there's no looking there, but it's implied. And when we're talking about cognitive linguistics, this is one of these really interesting things. We know what it's like when we walk up to someone and you see them face to face and you're standing there with them and you're talking to them. But here's this interesting thing about this picture is that now we've kind of bifurcated ourselves. So there's two of us. Here I am and then I walk up and I see myself and it creates this really interesting little image of coming to yourselves. And it's one, I mean, we use this even down to today. And I think the whole idea of looking at yourself is implied there because when you come to yourself, you see yourself, you're facing yourself, you're engaged in a dialogue, you're evaluating that person. And so I think that's, it's definitely implied there in what, what your pastor uh, was saying. So thank you so much again for your time and your expertise. Uh, I do hope that people are drawn to your YouTube channel, you know, free information there. Um, but thank you so much, Dr. Paris. I hope these few nuggets from our interview really increases your interest to go and give Justin's podcast a listen. Once again, as I said, I'm going to have the link to his podcast underneath this video here. So click on it and go check them out. Next week, we're going to jump back into Matthew, specifically Matthew chapter 3, where Matthew talks about how Jesus arrives in Galilee to start his ministry. And Matthew cites the Old Testament prophecy and calls it Galilee of the Gentiles. But here's the question. Galilee was not Gentile. So why does he say this? What's going on there? Until next week, I will leave you with the word of peace. Peace.